Welcome to the final videotape of the series entitled New Discoveries from Old Manuscripts. And I think you're going to find this one of the most exciting adventures of all. We're going to look at the feasts in relationship to the seventh month of the Jewish year. Now, the feasts that relate to end time events. And I think you're going to find it as exciting as I do. In fact, these things are so important in the Jewish economy that they preceded it with a few days called Teshuvah. The word Teshuvah simply means repentance or return to God. Teshuvah, of course, is a tradition. And there are good traditions and there are bad traditions. There are some traditions that are quite harmful, especially when they replace things of Scripture. But there are also traditions that are quite helpful. Uh, some traditions that you're probably used to is having a song service before the regular church service begins. Nothing in the Bible about doing that. That's a good tradition. Another one, usually there's a special music just before the sermon. Nothing in the Bible says that, but it is a good tradition. And when you see the deaconesses removing the linen from the communion table, where in the scripture does it say to do that? It's just a good tradition that brings us into solemnity and sacredness and the beauty of the service. Teshuva is associated with the ancient feast days given to Israel, especially of the seventh month. And the feasts of the seventh month do parallel and teach certain events that re realize are soon to take place. As an example, the judgment of the church involving the sealing of the 144,000. And we know that's followed with a loud cry and the final giving of the message of this planet. And in turn, that's followed by the close of probation on the world. But it's not over yet because then there's a time for Jacob's trouble. And after the time for Jacob's trouble is finally the deliverance. And after the deliverance, the second coming. When it comes to the timing of these events, are they really uh, obvious in the Jewish economy and the times thereof? Well, when it comes to that, Ellen White was quite clear. She wrote the words in great controversy, saying, In like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. Timing, then, is important, and timing was in the symbolic service of the Israelites. Perhaps we could look at the context of Ellen White's statement and get a little more idea of what she's talking about. So let's read the context. On the 14th day of the first Jewish month, the very day and month on which for 15 long centuries the Passover lamb had been slain, Christ, having eaten the Passover with his disciples, instituted that feast which was to commemorate his own death as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That same night he was taken by wicked hands to be crucified and slain. And as the antitype of the wave sheaf, our Lord was raised from the dead on the third day, the first fruits of them that slept. And then she adds, in like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. Well, what times were pointed out in the symbolic service, and how do they relate to last day events? Well, some of the times include Passover or unleavened bread, wave sheaf, Pentecost, trumpets, Day of Atonement, tabernacles, you know what they are. But then, of course, there were the sabbaticals and even the jubilee. All of these things are involved in their times. Now, in this lecture, we'll be investigating several end-time happenings that can be seen in the services conducted during the seventh month. The seventh month had a name. It was called Tishri, T-I-S-H-R-I. Its appointed times contain prophetic significance that is quite serious. In fact, Hebrew tradition went right before this seventh month, 
with that time of repentance called Teshuvah. So in this hour, we're going to examine these events and see that they do parallel last day issues. But first, I think it's very important to explain the word Teshuva. And once again, it simply means repentance or a time for returning to God. I want you to look at the chart now, and you'll see on the bottom of the chart a little darker blue area. That symbolizes the place of Teshuva now. And Teshuvah was a special season of 40 days. It ran all through the sixth month, which they called Elul, and continued through the first 10 days of the seventh. Teshuvah was a 40-day experience. Notice the darker text of greeting that says, quote, May you be inscribed in the book of life. The greeting during the first 30 days of Teshuva, for it was a 40-day experience, but the first 30 days had that special greeting. In other words, it was not so much shalom, meaning peace, but in English it translates, may you be inscribed in the book of life. Now several things went on during Teshuva, and being inscribed in the book of life would be pretty serious, wouldn't it? Uh, notice the first line on the upper left, just below the first red per perpendicular rod on the chart. They would have two readings from the Psalms each day. The shofar would sound after evening worship. And Ezekiel 33, 1 through 7, would be read aloud. Why? <laughs> well, to give an imperative warning, a serious time for repentance. Repentance, judgment is coming, and it seemed to fit with the thoughts and feelings of the time. Uh, notice the text from Ezekiel 33. Quote, Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast, and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then, so who are, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Continuing with verse 5, He heard the sound of the trumpet, and took not the warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee as a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at, thy, at my mouth, and warn them from me. Teshuvah then was uh, considered as a time of warning that something was coming, some kind of a judgment was coming. Often when soldiers came through Israel, it was a time of judgment because Israel had been backsliding. That's not the case here with the Shuvah and the Feast of Trumpets soon to come, but the idea, the principle that something is coming in the way of judgment is what the text is referring to. I want you to notice something else regarding the time of Teshuvah. Notice the darkened word H-A-T-A-A-T. -A -T -A -A -T. Hatat is a word that directs one's repentance toward Elohim. Uh, various scriptures would be read at that time. We're thinking about asking God to forgive our sins and our transgressions and to restore us into favor. Here's a text that was often used. From Job 42, 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge?